My name is Jim Baird, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about my experience on the show alone, which is well, uh, on History Channel. What the show is, it's a self-shot survival reality show. Uh, so there's no camera crews. Um, you got to film everything yourself. Now the production team, they'll come out and they'll do med checks just to make sure you're not going crazy or you're not horribly injured and that kind of thing. And so other than that, you have very little, if, if no communication with the outside world at all, you're cut off and it's a competition. Whoever can survive out there the longest with 10 basic items you pick from a list. So, you know, you can't pick um, a case of scotch and a machine gun. You know, you have to pick, you know, a saw, an ax, a knife, basic survival tools. And whoever can last the longest wins uh, $500,000. So people really want to go. And there's a thousands of applicants that try to get on this thing. And uh, this, year, this season, when I went on with season four, um, they actually did family members. So what they did was they, they separated us. So they started us completely in different spots. No idea how long it would take to find my brother. Uh, no idea, no map, no idea really where I was. They just flew us out in a helicopter, started doing donuts, and just pitched me off out of the helicopter in the middle of nowhere. And uh, luckily for me, I, I had some background in this. and I, I shoot a lot of my stuff. And so I've, uh, I started uh, fairly young, probably in my early 20s, doing expeditions in the Northwest Territories, in Alaska, and a lot of them by canoe, backpacking, a lot of self-propelled adventures. And I started really thinking, well, I want to do this. I, I don't really want to get like a normal job. Uh, I want to be able to just keep doing adventures. And so it was through content creation and videography. And then I guess uh, branding and working with other companies um, to integrate them into the, the, the articles that I write and the video series that I create, which was sort of a, a, driving, uh, a driving kind of a force behind me being able to get out there and be an adventurer full time, which I've been doing for about four years now. And that got me basically on the show because they're like, okay, Jim's hardcore. He knows how to film and he's done all these trips, but I'm not really a survival expert, right? So I'm not out there making bow drill fires and tracking animals and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, f napping arrowheads and stuff like that, right? I bring my gear with me. Um, I'm bringing, you know, a lot of gear, like 10 lighters with me, a canoe, a f you know, fishing stuff. I'm bringing food. Out here, no food. You, we started out with, I think, a pound of food. And so, Basically, that's just what I had, a compass. I had a compass bearing. I thought it was gonna be like three days to, to find my brother. Um, in the end, it took me eight days. I found out afterwards it was 10 miles. So just to give you an idea of how dense the bush is there, eight days and 10 miles. When I got back and after some recuperating, my wife and I, that's my wife over there, Tori Wave. She's, I'm just embarrassing her right now for fun. Um, but uh, we did a uh, hundred miles in eight days, right? So that's how, when you're, when you're starving hungry and you're trying to eat. So what, what do you eat out there? Well, one of the things that, oh, first of all, of course, of course, my line of travel had to go around tons of these lakes, which to my horror, didn't have any fish in them. Or if they did, they're out too far and deep. And so I tried fishing in them, but I couldn't. So I had to, um, anybody that's traveled by compass bearing, uh, when you're in such dense bush, you can't just sight a mountain. It's not like here and you can be like, that's where we're going. You have to just pretty much hold the compass like this and try to walk straight. And uh, when you get to a lake, you gotta sight something on the other side, bushwhack around it and try to line, your up, line yourself up with that thing and where you were. So that really added a lot of time. And especially when I'm just eating mushrooms, okay? So this is at the end of mushroom season and one of the things I really researched is what kind of wild mushrooms can I eat out there because I knew that was something that I'd just be able to come across in my travels. So these are winter chanterelles and by the way all these uh, all these um, these photos are actually captures from the actual television series on History Channel. Um, so I would come up and I, every time I'd see these, I took one of my gaiters because we weren't allowed to bring bags. So I took a gaiter, I turned it upside down, tied the top up and hung it here and just jammed these mushrooms into there. And what I'd do is I would uh, 
I collect as many as I can. This is, you know, obviously not from when I was out there, but that's an example of a, a, a chanterelle mushroom. That's not a winter chanterelle, but you can see the golden color and that's a golden chanterelle and you can see the, the forking false gills, they called them. So this was kind of my staple out there as well as hedgehog mushrooms, oyster mushrooms and uh, some boulettes uh, called slippery jacks. And I just ate a ton of these things every day. So I'd be walking along and I'd see a patch like that. Those are golden chanterelles and I'd just gather them all up. And then what I'd do is I'd make a fire at night and I'd cook them and I'd, I'd cook about a hot, which is by the way, not easy in the hammering rain because it was the rainiest November ever on record. I should also mention that this was Northern Vancouver Island um, where it it's actually a little island off the north coast of Vancouver, an uninhabited island. So it rains a lot there. And uh, so then I'd eat half of them. I didn't have time to make a fire in the morning because it takes so long there. And so I'd keep the other half in my, in my hat. And I'd have to just eat those cold every morning. I called it the breakfast of champignons. I don't know if any, that means champignons means mushroom in French. Sorry, yeah, I thought that was gonna kill. Um, so here's the other thing I ate was slugs. And these things are, you know, it's not so much the flavor, it's the slime. The slime content is very, 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 very high on these things, uh, but they're big. And I was actually like excited because by, by this time I'm like three days in, I'm excited to eat this slug. So I just boiled the thing up like this and um, just with how I just basically cooked everything. That's a little bot pot. So the bot pot is a, uh, uh, actually um, works as a canteen, but also uh, to boil stuff with as a cooking pot. And that was me cutting it in half. There's me, oh wait, oh, there's me about to eat it. And there is my, <laughs> do you see the little drool line of slime there? So after this, I kind of boiled them and roasted them, but I, I continued eating a fair amount of slugs. Uh, yeah, I, I probably shouldn't be admitting that, but it's already on television, so whatever. So uh, when you're out there, there are uh, the highest population density of mountain lions in the world. Right, not just like in BC or in the Pacific North, anywhere in the world. There's more. I forget. They told us how many per square mile there was, and it was just like flabbergasting that you don't see one every five minutes for how it was, right? And so I'm not really used to, to dealing with mountain lions. So I asked a, a couple locals, "Well, how do you know when a mountain lion is stalking you?" And they said, "Well, you don't know. You you just feel it." And I'm like, "Okay, you know, you feel. They, yeah, you'll know when they're staying. You feel." I'm thinking. Like, am I like Obi-Wan Kenobi? Like, I understand that connection. I've, I've had feel, like that kind of feeling before, but how am I gonna know? Anyways, long story short, I'm crouching down by my fire, which is probably the worst position to be in, crouched down, looking small. And all of a sudden, I have this feeling like, whoosh, comes over my entire body. And I'm like, oh my God, a mountain lion staring at me. I'm like, I, I really knew, just like I was being told. And so I turned around and I looked and I didn't see anything, but then I just saw a big wide black shadow tr travel like this, making no noise. So at nighttime, if it's a bear, it's probably gonna be a male, but you're probably gonna hear it. So the fact that I saw this and I didn't hear anything and I had this feeling like I was being hunted, mouth like, now there's a possibility it could have been just like in a cartoon where there's a mouse and then there's the big shadow and it scares everyone. But um, so basically what you do if a mountain lion's there is it, what we were taught too, what I've learned is you, you make that cat know that you're not something that's gonna be easy to eat. So instead of just sitting there like, ah, or, or tapping out, they give you a, a satellite beacon that if you wanna get out, you tap out and you get you know, extracted by helicopters and these like search and rescue guys and they get you out of there, right? So uh, anyway, so basically what I did was I just grabbed my ax and I screamed, swore, ran it in the woods, like swinging my ax. And then, you know, it was, uh, I actually had, I actually caught it on camera too, but um, you'll have to check that out. I'll post it to my website or something after this. But uh, uh, luckily I didn't get eaten. Still lots of time. It was early in the trip. And uh, this here is a grouse. Okay. So that would be a big deal. I'm eating slugs and mushrooms here, people. So I'm walking along, I see this grouse. I'm like, I really want to eat that grouse. So what I did was I got a stick there. You can see on the left and I crept up as close as I could and I threw the stick and I'm like, at this point, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm eating dinner tonight. And then if you can see here, just missed by an inch, by an inch. So uh, I ate slugs again. Um, not, not the most, not the most fun. So anyways, eventually, uh, 
after eight days of, of bushwhacking like this, I, uh, I did meet up with my brother, who hadn't really accomplished very much, unfortunately, but he'd started to build this boat. And at this point, we could start kind of building these sort of uh, bushcraft type of things that we thought would bring us and give us more food. Um, I, we were actually able to, uh, um, you know, because it was History Channel, you're not allowed to uh, give sponsor plugs and that kind of stuff in there, but we were actually able to get away with something. I've been working with Arcteryx. We both wore Arcteryx clothing. Um, I, worked, I, I wore a Tilly hat, um, who's another one of my sponsors, and I was actually able to wear the Tilly hat and also uh, mention it mention it and they, it, that actually kind of got in so they they did allow like a little very subtle product placement which made some of the sponsors i work with very happy because about one and a half to two million people watch the show in the u.s every week and then it's sold internationally so we thought okay a boat's going to help us get food right so what and then this and then i figured a crab trap i found this net this just washed up on the shore and i'm like what can we do with this so we started making a crab trap what can we do to get food but one of the biggest misconceptions that the survival books don't tell you is just how hard it is to have time to do all these projects. Like you go out there, you think, oh, we're gonna build a log cabin, we're gonna build a boat, maybe we'll build two boats, you know, maybe we'll build a bow and arrow, uh, you know, we're gonna, uh, you think that it's gonna be that easy, but what you don't realize is how long, and it's one of the things we really take it, uh, for granted in our society is how long it actually takes to procure food every day you're working in your garage and you're building a boat or something you get hungry you're like oh, i'm just gonna order up a pizza you hammer the pizza you, maybe you're done the thing in a weekend out there it can take it'll take 21 days to do that because a pizza when you're out here on vancouver island eating fish bait that takes six to eight hours a day to go forage for this food try to fish maybe you don't catch anything maybe you're you know just scraping whatever you can off the bottom of the rock eating limpets eating mushrooms you know eight hours go by then you have like two hours it's already dark to work on your project so i remember being a bit of an armchair quarterback myself going into it seeing that this other guy it took him 21 days to build a kayak on the previous season I'm like, God, we're just going to build one way faster than that. What, 21? That's crazy. It took us the exact same length of time because I myself was being a bit of an armchair quarterback. Um, so I ended up making this crab trap. We used snare wire. Uh, I ended up having to uh, weave sticks through those gaps because the first shot, it didn't work. The little crabs were just getting in, eating all the bait and leaving before the big ones could get in. Um, so uh, shelter. Now, one of the things that we kind of got chewed out for was having the worst shelter ever, right? So it floods a lot there, it rains a lot. So what we did was we built a raised platform, but basically we just slept in it like, like, like this, you know, more or less a lean-to. And one of the things you're very confined by too is, you know, that the survival books don't tell you is that you're really left with what you have in more or less your basic area. So to build that canoe and to build just this shelter, we had to walk, you know, 100 yards this way, 50 yards this way through dense bush because all the trees around us were thousand year old massive cedars. So we can just chop them down and we're not building a dugout out there, right? We couldn't, so the, the, we were really kind of limited with what we could build just because of the materials we had at hand. Um, but, uh, uh, so this, this is basically what we sh slept in here. It wasn't very fancy. Eventually we pulled that down because uh, we hit one of the coldest winters, uh, well, the coldest winter in the last 30 years there. And this is sort of where we lived out of. And finally, uh, we got this boat finished off. And what it was made with, it was wire. One of the items we brought is trapping wire. Now, we weren't actually allowed to trap um, because of certain laws, but there's no small game there anyways. I think I saw one squirrel the whole time. There's no rabbits there. There's very little raccoons. So, uh, but we thought, well, there's a hundred other great uses for wire. So basically, we, we made this. And you can see how the front is uh and the front and back the bow and stern are made out of trees that we found growing out of the side of a hill right so they grow and they curve like this and you take two of them and you lash them together like that and that's what you begin to build your boat frame around and then the idea was uh, we wrap it with a tarp so there's my brother and i uh, getting in our boat and it, the thing floated 
I actually had a, a video here of us paddling around, but unfortunately that's not working. But uh, it, we were able to kind of just get out there and feel uh, like we could move around, we could travel, we could get to better fishing spots, we could launch our crab trap and that kind of thing, which was great. So food, what were we eating out there? Well, this is a fishing rod I made. You can see how I made kind of like a, a spool um, right underneath my hand and I used just snare wire for guides and I was able to almost unravel it and cast. So our site, it didn't have any deep spots around. So the, the ability to cast out just using limpets or whatever we could find for bait worked. Um, those are a bunch of sable fish right there. Uh, so once in a while, this run of sable fish would come through. So it'd be like nothing, we could not get, and then all of a sudden all the, the school would come through and you could pull one out as fast as you could put, rebate your hook. Um, it was really exciting, really exciting times. There's a lot of highs in those. The rest of the time, the best thing we had to eat was these things, they're called gunnelfish. Who's hungry, right? Who, does that make you guys hungry? No, right? And this is actually fish. So what these things are is basically writhing eels that live underneath rocks. And what you gotta do is, you, this is them cooked up in a pot there. Uh, so basically we boiled everything because boiling stuff it, you don't lose the nutrients because you can eat the, eat the fish and then you can drink the water afterwards. So you're not really losing, to just roast it or something like that, um, you're losing some of the nutrients uh, doing it that way. So we basically kind of made a soup. But these fish, they can kind of, uh, they don't die. They just can live under rocks at low tide. And so even if you get them and they're out of water for a long time, they're still kind of alive. And they're so slippery, they're so hard to catch. Basically what we had to do is this, is this is where we, we got our food in the intertidal areas. So we turn over these boulders and there'd be nothing. There'd be nothing. There'd be nothing underneath. And finally you turn one over, there'd be all these gunnel fish and we just start ah, like trying to stomp on all of them and we'd have our knife out and one would try to be escaping and we'd be like stabbing and stomping on them and next thing you know there'd be like 12 there. We'd be like, yes, it was really, it was pretty savage actually. But that's how we managed to, uh, to get a lot of our food. A lot of the time we ate uh, limpets, um, which are just these tiny, small little sea creatures. And one of the things you also don't realize is, if anybody heard of something called rabbit starvation before? Rabbit starvation. So um, for those not familiar with it, it's what your body cannot digest proteins without fat uh, and without carbs. Because, so you, you even no matter how much, all you eat is rabbit, and it happens to trappers and stuff like that that run out of food um, in traditional times. Like if, you, if all you eat is rabbit, you will still starve to death because there's no fat. And that's what we were running into. We're eating a ton of these limpets and stuff like that, but we are still hungry and you'd still eat them and you'd still feel hungry. It was, it was kind of like, a, it wasn't a very fun way to, to, to pass the days. We did have a fish net. A uh, fish net didn't really produce at all. This was the, the best time we ever caught anything in it. We caught, uh, I think, seven or eight sable fish. Um, and that was even before I got there. And my brother, of course, ate them all before I was there. And after that, we realized this, it was such a small net and setting it up was so much work that it didn't really, we were thinking we'd be loading in with it. And it, it, it turned out to be a bit of a letdown, unfortunately. Um, so winter. Usually Vancouver Island, uh, as, as wet and damp as it is, usually it doesn't get to be uh, horrifically cold. Except when we were there, it got horrifically cold. Uh, so my brother and I, I think one of the best things we did is we decided to dress really warmly, but we dealt with temperatures consistently of uh, minus 10 Celsius, which is in Fahrenheit, I don't know, 10 degrees below freezing, right? To below the freezing point, right? And, uh, and when it's an incredibly damp cold like that, it just really, it almost feels at time that it doesn't matter if you're wearing the biggest down coat any ever. It just feels like that the heat's just still being sucked right out of you. So it was day after day of minus 10. We both have fro got frostbite on our hands where our gloves weren't the best, unfortunately, because we didn't think it was going to be minus 10 all the time. Um, but you saw the ground froze. We actually had snow that, that stayed there. And so you saw our, our terrible shelter. Now, one of the most important things when you're building a survival shelter is the more you can do to block the wind. You know, the wind, and you should, we had like a, a synthetic um, a sleeping bag that's supposed to be good to minus 30. 
but you know when the wind blows through it, it doesn't hold it. You know, it's just whoosh, it's gone. The heat just goes out, and then you you have to rebuild the heat. So we started freezing our butts off. So what we did every night, this was kind of like our little routine. We we'd set up a fire. Chopping wood, of course, was getting harder and harder to find it. But we'd heat up rocks every night. So we'd find we found rocks from the ocean that were more or less smooth. And we put them in the fire and we end up burning a lot more firewood and uh, we basically just transported them and then stuck them in the sleep in the sleeping bags at night put a few in our pockets and that worked out really really well um, it made all the difference in the world you'd be amazed at how hot of a rock you can put in your sleeping bag without it burning like it'll burn your skin which I actually did. <laughs> I burnt my foot, but it'll burn your skin long before it burns your sleeping bag. And that ended up to be the saving grace because we found out afterwards, uh, some of the other people out there had like really bad frostbite on their toes. They actually lost uh, their toenails. Um, one of the, the older guys that was on the show, one of the competing uh, teams out there. So I wish I brought warmer boots. So here's us with our crab trap. Now, one of the other things you realize about the survival is since you only have so little time really to do these things that are going to bring you more food uh, you really have to think them out i'd never set a crab trap before i'm an inland guy i thought oh whatever you know just throw it in there and just load it with crabs what we ended up using is a fire extinguisher that my brother found that was washed up on the shore Okay, perfect. We're going to use this as a float, right? Because uh, you know, it's been floating around the Pacific. It's, you know, what, what could go wrong? Anyway, so we, we set this crab top, which we'd invested so much time in. And, um, uh, you know, I, that's me out there in the boat fishing in the crab traps after I dropped the, uh, fishing in the kelp beds after I dropped the crab trap. And, ooh, that's, uh, that's another story there. And uh, what ended up happening was the, the float we had sunk. So we lost our crab trap after putting all this time and energy into it and all the barnacles made it so the tarp around our boat, every time we'd launch our boat, try to bring it to shore, it would just get ripped and shredded and all these holes stabbed into it. So eventually what ended up happening is we lost our crab trap and we more or less couldn't even use our boat anymore because by this point, you know, getting on, um, you know, we were getting very weak. So all this time you put into it, it could, it could have been, it, we could have died. That could have been like game over if it was a if we didn't have a tap out button and there was no you know crew of like these british like commando dudes to roll in and save us they were the, totally they're quite good characters um we could have uh, we could have died injuries out there that's my brother embedding a hook into his finger one of the great things to one of the items that we were allowed to bring is i think 23 hooks and, and fishing line 300 feet of fishing line um, so he was trying to set a trot line and that's where you put a whole bunch of hooks on one line and you throw a rock out like this um, by this time my brother and i weren't really getting along too well anymore if you can imagine you know we're about 50 days in eating fish bait you know uh, you, like i mean i get angry if i miss lunch you know for crying out loud right um, so we're in an argument about, uh, oh no, don't, don't throw the rock out, don't set the line like this. this, this. He's like, shut up. I'm like, no, nah, you shut up. And he throws it out, bam, hook lodge into his finger. I'm like, I told you that was going to happen, right? Anyways, he took the pliers and uh, it's actually a, a way you can do, it's right in there. But um, there's a way, what you do is you can, um, there's a couple ways to do it. But the way he did it was he put the pliers on the back of the loop and he pushed down on the hook which kind of disengages the bar, the, the back of the curve, and he pushed, pushed down on the hook, which disengaged the barb, and just whoosh, yanked it out quick like that. Of course, if the barb doesn't disengage, it's going to be, you know, pretty, pretty uh, ouchy, you know, it's going to be pretty painful. But it worked no problem. She, he whipped, ripped the hook right out. And uh, then, of course, we were concerned about infection, which somehow he just managed not to get. So that was pretty good. Um, and this, around this time here, uh, was um, Christmas actually <laughs> uh, we, we actually got out of the bush around this time last year then then of course they waited and the show ran the, the last episode of the show ran in uh, September so we had I couldn't believe it was actually happening that we had to miss Christmas and New Year's out there and by this time we had lost a lot of weight i went i went into this thing weighing um 230 pounds uh 235 pounds i came out 
weighing 186. Uh, now I'm back up to a healthy uh, 275, but uh, um, it was it was not it was not easy just to to know. And it, you get to that point where it's not like okay, well I'm just gonna I'm just gonna you know get one good meal in me and I'll be right back to there. No, you get to the point where it's gonna take you weeks to get back to feeling normal and having a normal kind of energy. Like we couldn't just like uh, eat a, catch a duck and eat a fish and, and be like, oh right, it's like day one again. At that point, you're, you're kind of so far gone that you really need to have like a sustainable uh, protein rich, vitamin rich fruit, food source. Because at this point we're, we're kind of, uh, you know, having like a bit of a starvation issue was going on with us. Um, so very tough, but it makes you kind of realize how lucky that you are. So it, you kind of reflect on the fact that like, we're out here that we're missing Christmas, but you know what? We're shooting a network TV series. You know what I mean? We're getting to do this uh, survival thing. We're getting to spend time with each other as brothers, which we weren't really in that headspace at the time. We're more like, I want to kill you at this point. But um, uh, it really kind of gives you an idea of how so many people in the world starving, you know what I mean? And, and how privileged we are to be able to go back with the family and have the whole, you know, turkey dinner and, and do all that. And you kind of realize how much you take stuff like that for granted. So it was a good lesson in, in that case. Um, as, the, uh, as the days got on, that's a, a saw we brought there. It's huge. It was really crappy for cutting small things, but for cutting big things, it turned out to be good because eventually all we had left was very, very, very large trees to cut and they were far. So trying to saw through these things. So it, it turned out when our energy was really kind of drained, it sort of turned out that what we could do before breakfast, that amount of wood, you can whip out there with a saw and an ax, cut it, drag it, you know, drag a tree back to camp in the hammering rain, chop it all up, throw it on the fire, you know, and, and it's fun. That would take us like six hours. Like we'd be sawing like this, and then, okay, yeah. <sighs> you know, like three, four strokes was exhausting. And, uh, and you can see the kind of um, uh, culture at the end. This is the kind of stuff that we had to deal with, right? Um, so what we learned is that instead of uh, sawing, like coining individual pieces that are about as thick as this little thing right here, um, what we ended up doing was, uh, was cutting them, making saws, and for pieces this tall and then splitting those pieces and this was dry yew wood it's called yew and it's actually a hardwood but it was dry enough that it split well and then we'd break those pieces up with the axe into threes and we found that we saved a lot of energy that way because energy was uh was um you know in, in really short supply there's me uh, splitting. You can see the size of the wood we were still splitting. So obviously we had some energy left if we were still managing to pull that off. And uh, well, I guess after, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it started getting really hard and you, you become, I guess, trapped in a way by your own energy levels. Uh, because if you think about, think about food when you're out there is equal to money in the bank. Right. And I think a lot of people think about just going and living off the land in a romantic notion. Traditionally, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, I've, I've done canoe trips and I get a massive connection with nature, but you're going out there with food. Or if you think about native peoples that live on the land in, in a tribal situation, they're not doing this. OK, being a good outdoors person is how to never wind up in this situation. Right. Uh, like the natives used to plant trees along the, you know, fruit trees along the portages. Uh, they had already loaded in and salmon all summer. They were, at this point, they were thriving in their plank houses. Um, you know, they weren't out there trying to survive. So one thing, uh, after about 70, 60, 60 days, I started to find a deep connection with restaurants, um, uh, society. But at the same time, it was a very interesting experience because I, I could learn my own limitations and I can learn what's possible and not possible and really how far you can go without eating. So I remember kind of now I kind of see uh, nature and, and in a much uh, less threatening way, I think, that, that I learned that a way that, you know, I could go out there and be 
better off than I thought I could be. And so in a way, it does give you a deeper connection. But when you're out there, uh, you know, um, uh, suffering for, for a long time, you, you, want, you really start to want a warm house, I'll tell you that much. Anyways, after 75 days, um, my brother and I won the show. Uh, we were the last people standing. There was one other group that we were just out there. Who the hell are these guys? How are these guys still out there? And uh, it was an older, older gentleman and his son. And I, I, you know, I give so much credit to them and what they were able to do. But I guess uh, they, well, I think what helped me and my brother win was that we were just force feeding ourselves all this uh, crap. So we would just force ourselves to get up and forage and pack down whatever gross food we could every day. And uh, what, how they did it was, um, how, how basically we won was, uh, um, uh, well, w when we did win, what they did was they didn't tell us. So they, do, they always do these like med checks. Um, and so every time they come up into a med check, and you know, med checks would be fairly regular, like every two weeks, and they'd come out and they'd surprise you. Uh, so, and they'd always film and we'd be like, and they'd make you strip your clothes down and they'd weigh you and you'd be like, oh my God, like, uh, you know, can we like this, it's freezing out. Right. Um, and they'd always film and they do a little interview. So what they did was the same thing they're doing a med check and they're filming. And I had an idea. Okay. We got a freaking one, this thing by now, like, come on here. And what they did was they snuck our wives in behind us, Tori. So they called Tori and they're like, don't tell anybody top secret but Jim won, the sh Jim won the show. So we got to get you out here to Vancouver Island. We got to get you. So they fly Tori out there and they bring her in another boat back behind us and they sneak her in behind us when we're, uh, you know, when we're doing this interview. And me and my brother are sitting there and all of a sudden we hear, hi, and we turn around and the girls are there and we knew that we'd won and we're just so overjoyed. Um, my brother just had tears in his eyes. We were high, you know, I didn't cry because, um, you know, uh, but uh, but I, 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 was, I was holding it in, okay? And, um, and we were just hugging the girls and high-fiving, and it was such a, an accomplishment to, to um, not only see them again, who we, we realized how much we missed them. I, I proposed to Tori. Uh, actually, she was with my girlfriend at the time. How many weeks after that did I propose? <laughs> a couple of weeks after that, it was like I proposed because I just realized how important she was to me when I was out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, a float plane came in, and uh and took us away um and i guess uh that was it we won the show so alone was quite the experience and uh um you know looking back at what i thought about survival if you remember what i was talking about earlier um not thinking i was like a survival expert i'm not one of those guys on youtube that's making bow drill fires and i love that kind of stuff and i'm learning it but i'm more of a i go winter camping i do i've, I've walked across the northern ungava peninsula in winter solo i do whitewater canoe trips i put myself in situations where it's dangerous okay as long as you get the fire going you're going to be okay as long as you get that snow block wall built you'll be able to get your tent up and you won't freeze to death but if you don't well you know you're going to die guaranteed right so i have been in those very realistic situations before i didn't know how they're going to transfer and i guess the the, the lesson for me is that um, you talk about survival skills and it's all something that all of us as outdoors people need to know basic ones and might have to fall back on if you know stuff hits the fan one day um, and unfortunately the most important survival skill which is what i realized one me and my brother the show it's not something that you could learn on youtube okay it's not something that you can uh, get in a survival book it's basically just something that can only be learned from experience right it's that accumulation of putting yourself up there out there dealing with the elements toughing it out and just learning not to give a shit uh, about how hard things are just learning not to care and once you can get to the point where you're wet, you're cold, you're miserable, but you're still having fun. The person that doesn't have that experience will be like, I want to go home. This sucks. I'm cold. I'm ah, this food sucks. Ah, the mosquitoes or whatever. You're still enjoying it. So really that's only something that you can kind of learn from being out there. So the more you get out there, the more you do. So I don't, I don't know if as many, uh, 
cool survival skills you have, you're never going to last as long as the guy that's, you know, backpacked 100 miles, uh, you know, and in and, and eight days and has dealt with just that driving mental uh, uh, power of just telling yourself to keep pushing on when things get tough. And I think um, from my experience doing that, that's really what the deciding factor on what, wh what gave us the ability to uh, win the show was. So, yeah, so uh, I guess that uh, <laughs> concludes my talk, everybody. Thanks for, thanks for uh, coming to check it out. And uh, yeah, maybe I'll see you out there on the trails one day. Thank you. Oh, oh, wait, wait, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to do questions. Anybody have any questions? Anybody? Yeah? Oh, yes. Of course, I should have mentioned that. So yeah, we're filming everything ourselves. So we had a crappy JVC waterproof camera on a, on a, Go, on a Joby thing, which I thought were good before this. I'm not a fan of them anymore. Um, we also had several GoPros and our main camera was a, a, a Canon XA, uh, Vixia XA, uh, what was it, 30? It was the one step below the XA30, which is what I'm shooting now. Uh, of course, we were mic'd as well. Um, each camera was mic'd, so we also had to make sure our mics were good, um, our, our batteries in the mics were good. And what they do is they bring charging packs out, and then every time they do a med check, they bring out the most like ten thousand dollars worth of you know lithium ion batteries like this in a dry bag like this big you know what i mean and they'd leave that and they'd swap it out so we were able to literally roll all the time and, and catch a lot of the really real things that were happening out there yeah yeah um, well, I actually uh, power bombed one pretty hard one time. I'm just kidding. Uh, no, you know, other than that one time when, I mean, it's also, Vancouver Island's also the mountain lion attack capital of the world too, right? Uh, but I don't know. I just, uh, you know, other than the time that one came up to me at camp and was staring at me and I brandished my ax and screamed and, and uh, just acted like a wild Viking, which, you know, I could pull off pretty well, believe it or not. Um, after that, uh, that one experience, we didn't really come into uh, ha have any other issues. I saw some trails, I saw some scat, well that was it. A lot of other people on the show have had b serious bear problems. One of the kids, one of the other teams tapped out on day one because there's a bear right outside their, their tent. But I think um, because we went in so late in the season in late October and then it was such a cold winter, I think though a lot of the bears were hibernating too. So, um, so I guess we were just lucky. <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it, it was pretty powerful by the end, I'll tell you that much, yeah. Um, bar, bar, barnyardy. You know what? It, I, I bet you it did. I, I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah. I know just my dog that I keep, uh, you know, he likes to spend time outside. There's tons of coyotes around my property where I'm from, and we can just leave garbage bags right outside the front door, and none of the animals will get into it just because the dog pee and the dog scent is all around there, right? So, uh, anybody else? Uh, you. She, hey. Sorry. Um. What, what did you win and did they offer you like more adventures that are more challenging or Mr. Channel and like where you go for that? Well, uh, my brother and I won $500,000 US to split between the two of us, which was, you know, quite a bit more in, Can in Canada, uh, which was kind of awesome. Um, and then uh, I guess after that, we, I mean, I'm doing a speaking tour <laughs> and uh, I, you know, wrote some articles on it. They had PR people working with us. And what I'm, uh, what I'm doing now is I'm just c continuing, I guess, to just grow uh, my own brand. Um, so uh, I, I'm looking to do another show. Hopefully I have another show uh, this summer on Carbon TV where it'll be just me and my brother filming ourselves, doing a first descent of an Arctic river. Uh, for five weeks we'll be out there doing that um, i also shot two web video series uh, one for uh, hopefully it's going to be on backpacker uh, the other one for field and stream and also another one for canoe and kayak this this th this past summer um, so that should be coming out so I, i've been just continuing to build my co uh, content beginning uh, uh, continuing to build relationships i mean some of the relationships with sponsoring brands uh, and with magazines I, with canoe and kayak that's who's filming me right now um, it took me six years of calling 
calling them up and building relationship with the editor and begging and finally they're like, all right, Jim, we're gonna run your videos for crying out loud, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm just kind of continuing on that track, but it definitely has made things easier because people know who I am right now and have that following. So being a, an influencer, uh, it's it's a lot more um, it's a lot more interesting to to publications and to my own followers and to uh, brands as well. Yeah, uh, you had a question too. Yeah, what did you bring in your pack out that, uh, that you didn't need? Uh, well, you know, one thing we didn't really use. One of the items we brought was a bow and arrows. It had to be a traditional bow with wood and arrows. I think I shot at uh, a, 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 we shot at a couple ducks with it and missed, and that was it. So, I mean, maybe for like bear protection or if like a huge opportunistic thing came along, um, you know, it might have been it might have been good, but we probably didn't need it. Um, one thing I wish that would have been good is a roll of duct tape because we could have patched up all those holes in the bottom of our canoe. But, you know, you don't know if we were just launching on a beach, it never would have been an issue. You don't know where you're going to get dropped off. So it's very difficult. But we brought a pot, a tarp. We were also given a knife and a sleeping bag and a tarp automatically everybody got that and uh, we brought a snare wire we f we didn't bring cordage we luckily found some and uh, you know a, fa a ferro rod a bow um, and the the trapping wire and I guess that's about it so we, we had 10 items that you can pick off a list yeah yeah what did you do for, fire? Um, for a fire uh, it was it was very time-consuming there's no birch bark out there so everything that we we started was with a fer with a ferro rod, which is just you know it's a lot harder to start one than with a lighter with that, right? Of course, it'll last longer. So everything we started was splitting a standing dead tree, finding a standing dead tree, cutting it down, splitting it, and then uh, going under a tarp when it was raining and whittling out matchstick sized pieces out of the middle of that, making feather sticks that would take a a, a spark, and then getting a whole bunch of old man's beard drying it out like crazy and and then keeping that in a dry place in with our sleeping bag and then that would then take the spark and we wouldn't have to do that extra step of making all the feather sticks but it was a big process to get a fire going out there definitely yeah what do you find more challenging solo trips or traveling? uh you know that's a good question i i like traveling with other people because you laugh at stuff you know, when I find it's weirder going back after a solo trip to go back into society. Well, I'm out there, I don't feel weird. When I go back, it's like everything, I'm laughing at everything and I'm talking and it just feels weird, right? Um, there was some things about being out there for 75 days that were a little strange going back into society. Um, but uh, I guess to, to answer your question, I, I think I prefer um, being with other people, but I also like to do a solo trip once in a while too. Yeah? Uh, would I do a competition like that again was the question. Uh, uh, you know, it's not, I didn't even, I didn't even jump on the, the you know, my brother talked me into it, to be honest with you. If you, I think a lot of people think it's going to be easier than it is. And I was even one of those and I still was like scared to do it. Uh, but I, I think I'd do it again. I think I'd do better next time, challenge myself again. It is pretty hard on your body though. Yeah. So, uh, anybody else? Yeah. Uh, drinking water, he's asking about. Good question. Um, yeah, of course, it's mostly salt water. Uh, so one of the things we did, we had a, a creek near us that was drink, drinking water. But of course, you're going to want to boil that if you're just going to be drinking it all the time. So what we did, because it rained so much, we made a catch with one of our tarps. And then you can just pound that water straight because it's, it's distilled rainwater. Nothing's pooped in it, you know? So, yeah. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Well, hey, thanks a lot, guys. Great questions. Appreciate it.